I'm Bill Woodich. It's my pleasure and honor to speak to Virtual Vision Finance today. You know, this is a time of uncertainty. It's a time when we crave just a semblance of certainty. And we think about our purpose. We think about our why. We wake up and we're ready to go forward, but we stumble. We're, we like to stay back maybe in that circle of comfort. But to thrive today in any day, it takes an agility. It takes a learned skill. It takes the courage to move through those tentacles of fear and the avoidance of those things you have to do that come with a certain amount of failure. Today, we're going to dive into some of my background, how I trudged forward from the foreclosed future of a factory where I thought my existence was pretty much marked for all time. Within those walls, within those confines of my limited beliefs. Let's go on a journey. I learned to live the mantra always forward at a very young age. You see, for me, growing up in a very small town in the backwoods of Western Pennsylvania, there were limits that were pretty much insurmountable for most of the town. 3,500 people, snow this time of year, and just an overriding sense that this is the fate that we have to accept. This is the life that we have to endure as existence. You know, the one thing you never want to give up on, and the one thing that's most important for you going forward is dreams. Your dreams, those deep, deep seated aspirational desires, wants, needs for something more. Sometimes it's just a small voice. Sometimes it's a small voice that then becomes a rush to the head. And when it's something you have to have, something you can't live without, that's the way you begin to formulate the mindset that moves you always forward. You know, for me, those dreams were, I wanted the sun. I didn't want to be in snow to my backside all the time. I wanted, I wanted fun. I wanted something different. I wanted to, to break out of the woods. I wanted to see the light. And I wanted to be able to create every day something for myself that had the most important thing, the most important thing attached to it, freedom. So ask yourself a question right here. What is most important to you? Only you can answer. Only you can look in that mirror and see that reflection, ask that question, and hear that voice. What is it that's most important to you? You know, we all know what we fear. Fear's pretty easy. It asks one major question. Will I survive? That's the, the brain and it's, it, its sole function, its real primary function actually, is to survive. So it asks that question, will I survive? And most of us try to find a way to survive instead of pushing through to those dreams, to those aspirations, to do the work that makes them reality, to take the sting of rejection, to endure the fear of failure, to break through those limiting barriers that are here and break through from the heart to do those things and live that life, the life that the Greeks really would say is the purpose of living, and that's to find happiness. You know, happiness is a condition, and it's created by working through and with those things that prevent you from enjoying it. Always forward is an obligation. It's an obligation to the self. It's an obligation for you to live as true to your purpose, who you are, and what you're meant to be. That obligation doesn't come easy. No, it's, it's tough. And it comes with risk. It comes with work. It comes with the ability to see things for what they are and to be able to work through those things and to work with people to make those things a reality. It's an obligation. Are you ready for that? 
Well, this is my first real home outside of that small house in the backwoods of Pennsylvania. It was a factory that I, I went to work in first. You see, I, I wasn't going to follow that obligation. I wasn't going to heed that inner voice. So, yeah, sure, I knew I wanted more. But what I would do is just drink and smoke and just waste time not thinking about what it was I really wanted, but just trying to find a way to get to the next day. And then within that day to have as much fun as I could. And for me, fun wasn't being responsible. It wasn't being accountable. It was just existing to get to the next drink, to get to the next party, to get to the next place of fun. That's all it was. So a lot of my friends went off to university. They went on to different schools. Some of my friends stayed behind and we went to work in a factory, walked in at a certain time, punched a clock, came out, had a certain time allocation, maybe an hour for lunch, 10 minute breaks. And then we were done at five, punching back out with that clock. And I remember when I left the house and the person that held and knew most of my dreams and aspirations was my mother. And she, she was crying as I trudged through the snow my first day on the job. She thought, here's all this potential, but he's gonna waste it. He's gonna waste it existing as something less than. And that's the thing about potential. It is nothing, it's an illusion without the reality that comes from its execution, its lived embodiment. Well, I held those flickering dreams as I walked up every day to the factory and they started to become more and more bright and they started to pull on me and they really started to pull and tug and they started to to scream at me and i started thinking of something i want you to think about i started thinking about what if see what if is a powerful question and what if if directed in the right way if brought out for possibility not for protection not for protection from fear but from possibility of achievement are the two words you need to ask yourself. What if I did this? How can I do this? So every day in that factory, I started thinking, what is it that I'm going to give up? How can I take my first step out of here? What is it going to look like? Well, I don't know what it's going to look like. But I need to do it. Whatever it is, I need to do it. And so that voice started screaming louder and louder. And that pool started getting harder and harder. And it started tugging more. And every day, I couldn't stand to walk in there. And I finally said to the universe, look, I'll do whatever it takes. Whatever it takes. I don't know what that is. But whatever it is, I'm going to give it. It answered it this way. My parents gave me a chance to go on to university. They said, look, we'll give you one more shot. But if you mess this up this time, you're not getting another, sh you're not another chance. You've had enough. I was, I was scared. That was real fear. See, the real fear was failing there and having to go back and living the rest of my life as less than because I didn't answer that internal need, drive, and I didn't do the work that would push me forward. Or I would make excuses and say, I can't. I'm from here. I didn't know that. I wasn't raised this way. We didn't have money all conditional excuses. And if you're going to move forward in life and create that life for yourself and your loved ones, you got to get rid of the excuses that create a condition of foreclosed future, a condition of less than, a condition of acceptance, because the drive and the strive has to come through and with the work. And let me tell you, you're going to get hit by fear. You're going to get stuck on a plateau a failure. Every level has that devil. And as you climb in your career, as you work and move to win those hearts and minds, you're going to be met by resistance. And here's a question for you. Think about your dream. Think about what it is you really need. Think about and visualize what that looks like. Now ask yourself probably the most important question you can ask. What am I willing to give up to get it? You're going to recognize fear. It's going to tell you you can't. It's going to tell you you shouldn't. It's going to try to make you survive. Remember the brain. Number one job, make sure you survive. Don't stick yourself out there. You know, it's, 
interesting when I really dove into fear. My, my first book, Always Forward, and my follow-up book, Fail More, I really did a really deep dive in, into fear. And I found out that as babies, we have two main fears, just, just two. Fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. Survival, fear of falling and the fear of loud noises. We learn every other fear from our peers, from our parents, from our teachers. It's socially learned. So that's the key. See, being aware of that carries with it an obligation to do something, to make an action, to act upon what you now know. And see, now you're aware. Okay, so I've learned this in the classroom. I learned this by doing this or people telling me that you shouldn't do that or people saying you just don't look a certain way. You shouldn't. They're critiquing you, the criticisms, you're pulling yourself in. You learned all that. When were you at your best? When you could play as a child. And the only thing you worried about a lot of noises and the fear of falling. Recognize your fear, recognize where they come from and know the difference. Know the difference between fear as a protective ally and danger as an imminent threat from fellow man, reptile, or insect. See, fear is that early warning protection system. It goes way, way, way back in our DNA to the days when the saber-toothed tiger would cause us peril. So we had to stick together. We had to band together. We, if we were different, we were ostracized, part of our need for conformity. But see, the saber-toothed tiger doesn't exist in our conference room today. But we still react and respond in our brain as if it did. And most of that fear that we feel in the dark of our room when the bill collectors come in and the possibilities come in, when the what if takes a bad turn, instead of seeking possibility, it seeks protection. What happens then is we get limited. We shrink up into that room, into the darkness, and fear wins. You see, it's the florid part of our imagination that imagines the worst case as reality. And the first thing is that knowledge, that awareness carries with it that obligation to act. Write down what it is that you fear. Ask yourself a question, is this real? Is this real? Is this something that's my imagination? And most of the time, the imagination is really good about this. It goes back into the past and it takes some of those past experiences, some of those past pains, some of those Past, man, I tried to ask this girl on a date. She told me no. She told me I look terrible. And you won't go forward. Had to throw that in there. But we learned through life, through our peers, through our teachers, to have two major fears that we carry with us today. The fear of loss. We do not like to lose something we think we have. We, we, we don't want to lose. So if we have a gain, we, we want to keep it. And the fear of change. Mention the C word to your coworkers. Mention the C word around the house and watch people have a physical reaction to a word that's harmless. Change. Because change shakes the globe of security that you surround yourself with. The narrative and need for security is really unhinged when we use that word change. And I will tell you, the level of security you need is going to dictate the amount of success you have in moving on to that next project, in taking on that next new deal, in hiring that next person, in meeting that next prospect that you will then turn into a client. The more you need security, the more you shrink into that world, the less you're going to live in our world. To have the agility, the freedom, the movement, the expression, to live your dream, to create the conditions for happiness. Remember this, fear's first question, will I survive? Now, I always found this fascinating in every talk. It's one of my favorite times is when I talk about the brain and instinct and emotion and logic. You see, the top part of our brain is called the prefrontal cortex. It is the place of reason. It is called the CEO brain, a place where reason can occur. We can stop and think, wait a minute, now that... No, that's, that's a snake on the road. That, that, that's, oh, wait, that's a stick. Okay, but I'm far enough away from it. That snake's not going to kill me. And by the way, that was just only a stick. Now I can take those steps and move back away from those perils. All right? One's harmless, one's harmful. But before that, 
before that, when there was the saber to the tiger, we were instinct. We were instinct. We were not thought. We weren't emotion. We were pure instinct, pure survival. That's part of our brain, that small stem. It's called the reptile brain. We are in sway of that. The most powerful part of our brain is the smallest part. It is the instinct part. It is the part that makes us jail in our horn, get out, rage, rage, and just lose our minds in the conference room over a bad presentation. It is that piece that wants us to survive. Instead of getting up to the top part of our brain, the prefrontal cortex, we're stuck in the ooze, the primordial ooze of instinct. Through eons, emotion developed. The care and stewardship of others for others, feeling. But now the most powerful part that's got to come into play, and it has to come into play for you every day when you're stuck in the sway of fear, the prefrontal cortex, it's about the size of a shower cap, on the top part of your brain. That is the rational brain that will move you through the instinct that is fear. Write it down and think about it. It'll carry that obligation to act. Am I under the sway of my instinct brain? Just by asking the question, you're gonna to move to the top part of your brain and be able to assess what a real problem is, what a real fear is from those things that you need to do to cash that check of obligation. But the first thing I will tell you is you gotta be really clear about what it is you have to have. You see, for me, Remembering how it felt to walk in to those doors of a factory, to remember what it was like to not have food on the table. Remember and remembering what it was like to have hand-me-down clothes and to think, what is it that I have to do to change this? What is it that I have to do so I can go out and buy clothes so one day I won't have to look at price? What is it that I'm willing to do? What is it that I really, really have to have? Not just something that would be nice, but something that is necessary. Well, we each probably have this secret somewhere and it varies by individual. But for me, I needed to know how good I was. I needed validation. And looking back, it's probably weak, needing it from the external, but I needed that. I needed to see how good I was. So my first job right out of school was sales. And I didn't want to sell. I didn't like the word, didn't like what it stood for, didn't like what it felt like. I definitely didn't want to sell but I needed to eat. I had to have basic needs met. I needed to pay the rent. I needed to do something and that was the first most available something. And so I was sent away to different schools to learn from one of the biggest companies in the world to learn this process of how to do certain things, when to say this, when to say that, when to step away, all a formula. And I lost my first 13 sales attempts in a row. Now, most people think, well, at that point, you probably should try for something different, maybe go home, recalibrate, see if there's anything else you can do because you just can't do it in sales. But I didn't really think that way. I started thinking, okay, I'm failing, but why am I failing? And I'm, I'm flailing away, but what is it that's, that's keeping me from a yes? And that was me. That was me trying to follow somebody else's rules. That was me trying to follow a script. That was me trying to do something that was very unnatural for me. Instead of meeting with people as people, I was meeting with a concept, someone that would fill up a board, meet a sales quota. What a real person. I started thinking about what's most important, meeting people, moving through life with people, process, product, okay. The process is developed by people, the product is developed by people, and if we can drive enough of that and get enough people to buy our product, then we can make sales. Well, let's start with the first question. Let's talk to that person and ask them, where are you from? What did you have to do to get here? How did you earn this position? And the gates started to open up because when a person first meets you, when you first start talking at them, that little instinct brain is in control. It's not thinking, it's trying to survive. It's, it's assessing friend, foe, run, flight, fight. There's no thought. But when you ask that question, and people start to speak, you start to build the basis of understanding that you need to move your value forward. And this is about building your value. Get out there, meet people as people. 
when I did that, things took off. I started working my, my butt off. I was working harder than ever, but I was actually working smart. Getting to know people and knowing that not everyone was going to buy me opened up a lot of doors. Later on, as I became the top salesperson in that company, I reiterated that message, and I do to this day. It is about people, for people, through people. When we serve, we become served. When we first can understand that our obligation extends through the welfare, the care, the stewardship of others, we're liberated. We have the freedom of expression that makes us authentic, that makes us believable, that makes us real, that makes people want to partner with you. You see, the road to success is a tough one. First thing I want for you to do is to ask that question. What does success look like to me? What does it sound like? What does it feel like? Well, for me, at first, it was material. I didn't know any better. So I put a picture of a sports car up on a board, put a picture of a, a house in California overlooking the ocean. I thought, this is success. And it was measured in material gain. After you get so much of the material, that voice will call again. The voice will call and say, it's not enough. It doesn't fill the void. Where's my happiness? It doesn't go with that check. It doesn't go with that house. It doesn't go with those cars. Those things that are now on battery tenders or those things that you get used to will not be fulfilling enough because success is an aspiration. It's about something more just to achieve and to do more because you want to share more. You want to make this place a better place for others. Now, maybe that sounds altruistic, but that was my road to success. And it went through fear, and it went through failure, and it went through getting my ass kicked. It went through understanding that getting rejected 300 times a day was okay if I was going to be the best version of me that I could be. That was my mindset. That was always forward. And as you work together, together, the most important challenge is to share information without the thought that someone's gonna critique that, someone's gonna be critical, or someone's gonna use that, and I'm not gonna get credit. There's a whole lot of credit out there. When you start passing around the credit, walk away from the blame, you start to grow as a person. You start to create those conditions for happiness that come with the process. Now, what I learned is, as much as we may want to, as much as we have the energy, the fire, the power, We've got to have an intelligent approach. We've got to get to that top part of our brain. So this chart has helped me mentor many, many people through 30 years. Instead of giving direction, I'd ask for it. I would ask questions. And allow that person to find the answer with me. And the better the questions, the better the answer. And the first thing you need to ask, and you need to assess, what is the worst case? What happens if all this shit goes to heck in a handbasket? You can delete that if you like. What's the worst case? Now, what does winning look like? What does success feel like? What is it? So between your worst case and success, there's a middle road. And in that middle road of activities, of the things you need to do, Failure is littered all over. Small, short steps, you lose or you win, you learn. You lose, you pull it aside, you look and say, what could I have done different? You pull in your allies, you pull in those people from the outside, you ask those people who are your clients or your prospects, what could I do different? Because life is always, always about improvement. It's a process of improvement of going forward. You know. Life doesn't support senescence. It doesn't support standing still. It will not support the vacuum of the same. You're always changing. But making those steps from what's the worst case, will it kill me, to what's the best case, what does winning look like, what do I need to do in this process to move my value proposition forward is some of the most important questions, some of the most important processes that you can now undertake. And yet we're knocked off our axis, man. What we're hit by the unexpected. We don't like that. We like certainty. We like to have the same day. Even though we think we don't, we do. We like getting our Starbucks. We like hanging out with our friends at the coffee house. We like 
having dinners and doing these things. We got used to it, but now all of a sudden we got to be used to something different. Or do we? Survival's first. Being safe is smart, but living your life is paramount. Approach those risks that you have in the external intelligently. Learn and be responsible. But remember to fall in love with the question. How do I get through this? When do we get through this? What am I going to do? And what if this wasn't happening? What would I be doing now? See, what you're doing right there is amassing some skills. There you're doing the work. You're not just sick, sticking around saying, hey, wow, well, can't do this, can't do that. Might as well just put it on Netflix. Yeah, I do that sometimes too. But building your skill set is going to make you better when we all turn this thing around. See, that's the nature of always forward. Anticipate get punched, get down. Yeah, it hurts. It stings. What's the next step? Just take the small next step. Keep that vision in front of you. Keep it powerful. Keep that dream alive. I think a success journal is one of the major things you can do today. Write down those thoughts, those ideas, because if you don't, they'll vanish. Now, I knew this when I wrote both books. I thought I had an idea that I could keep until the morning. That won't happen. I thought I had an idea that could make it past two minutes. That didn't happen. Maybe I can understand the concept, but time had gone by. That success journal is going to tell you where you went wrong, what you did right, what you could have done better. It's the voice of you. And that, to me, has been one of the most important things in the process of getting better, of improving. Along with having this kind of a mindset, your mindset is going to dictate, you've heard this probably to the point where you just don't want to hear another speaker talk about mindset, you want to hear another author talk about mindset, but I can tell you this, I am not, I'm not someone who's a consultant telling you things that I'm not doing today. I'm in business. I have a business that runs from a growth mindset. And the more like-minded people I have that will break through a fixed mindset, the more we're going to grow. Carol Dweck is someone that you might want to research, Stanford researcher who found that in later life, those kids that she tested based on the results of a test or the process, the struggle to try to just go through the test, well, those ones that underwent the struggle, that put in the work, that had the willpower, that found it fun, that were not luxuriating in what she called the power of now, but they were living in the not yet. Those are the people that later in life were more successful, more economically successful than the other ones who only went after a fixed certain thing based on a grade. Ask yourself, are our teachers and universities doing the right thing by making us strive for something that's a grade instead of teaching us that it's the process, it's the work, it's the learning from failure, overcoming rejection, it's probably most important in our life. And speaking of life as I go forward, every time I opened up my doors for interviews, and over the years there have been hundreds and hundreds of people who've seen this, I really go back to the psychologist Maslow when I talk about job, career, opportunity, legacy. When you first walk into any company, and maybe you're, maybe you're here now, or maybe you will be again, your understanding of that opportunity, the real understanding, is pay the rent, pay the car, put food on the table, just basic instincts. It's maybe a nine by five cubicle. And your existence in that silo is, is a job. For us here, it's, it's nine to five. If you catch the fire, the culture, the way, the style, the people, the message, the industry, you start to build the parts of a career that move your value to a place where you start to realize some of those dreams. They become a little more clear. Some of those things are now obtainable. You're doing what it takes to become an indispensable part of a company, of an industry, of a society. As you keep striving, because remember, at the next level, the challenges are greater. Greater. They demand your adherence to the understanding that failure is a teacher if you learn from the experience. Other than that, it's just an experience. If you stay, 
and put the fire behind career. Ask those questions, what if, and look to create opportunity for yourself because you're, you're created it for others. You will grow into what I think and where I think I am now, and that's legacy. It's a process. And the process is most important. Carol Dweck will point out, it's those kids that move through the need to be perfect and understood that they wouldn't quit and they kept fighting forward. I can tell you that it's been a pleasure to speak with you and um, always forward. Any questions, you'll, you'll find my information. You can work from there and I'd be free to answer anything you'd have. Thank you.